All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our monthly meetup. This here is our very special guest speaker, Larry Bonfante. He's the CIO of the United States Tennis Association. And he's going to give us a wonderful experience of how to shape the future leadership for IT executives. Thanks. Appreciate everybody coming out and uh, braving the cold out there. At least we didn't get a snowstorm tonight, so that's a positive thing. Uh, just to get a feel for the room, how many of you currently are in roles where you have direct management responsibility working with technical people? Just show them that. Okay, good cross section. How many of you who don't have direct management responsibility are doing project management or some other aspect where you have to influence people? A couple of people, all right, and people who are in direct technical roles, individual contributors in their organizations? Okay. The good thing about this topic is leadership happens at every level in an organization. Okay? One of the things, you know, it's, it's interesting, when you go into an organization sometimes and you ask them about leadership, people feel that leadership is something that happens above them. And they're waiting for some you know, voice from on high to give them the answers and give them the direction. Excellent organizations, high performance organizations, are organizations where leadership is happening at every level in an organization. So hopefully what we talk about tonight, there'll be something in it that each of you can take and, and benefit from because we're going to talk about leadership. And how many of you remember the, a couple of years back, Nicholas Carr wrote an article in Harvard Business Review how IT doesn't matter. Anybody remember that? Okay, I remember that, and I've had some spirited conversations with Nicholas Carr about that. All right. What he was trying to say is that if IT is ubiquitous and everyone has the same tools and the same technology and access to the same technology, there's no differentiator in it, right? But what I would suggest to you tonight for your consideration is the difference is how you lead an organization leveraging technology. So the technology in and of itself is a tool, but leading an organization and really driving technology to make a difference in your organization is what does differentiate and creates a competitive advantage from one organization to another. So I'll, I'll, that's my thought on it. And what we'll do as we go through it is talk a little bit about various aspects of leadership, what you need to be an effective leader, and what the impact of leadership is in an organization. So for those of you who are hoping for a deep technical conversation, uh, you're in the wrong place tonight. All right, I'm not going to give you that conversation, but hopefully it is something that you'll be able to take away from, from this. Okay. And I'm hitting page down. And nothing is happening. This is going to be a very brief presentation. Right? Okay. Right, it doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter because when it doesn't work, <laughs> terrible things happen. Okay. All right, we're back to Eric Clapton. <laughs> Not sure why we're having this challenge, but we'll hopefully get rid of it in a second. This is a good networking opportunity. There we go. Hey, it's a live bit. Great. So let's talk about what we're going to be covering tonight. First of all, a brief definition of at least my version of what is leadership. How many of you have read a leadership book? All right. If there are 10,000 leadership books out there, which there probably are, there's probably 10,000 definitions of what leadership is. I'll give you my version of what it is, and more importantly, what it isn't. Because a lot of times, people get confused between management and leadership, and they think they're the same thing. They're very much not the same thing. So we'll talk about that for a couple of minutes. Then we're going to talk about that vision thing. How many of you have been a part of an organization where there's a vision for the organization? Okay. And how many of you, when you hear that or see that, your eyes kind of roll back in your head and you know, it actually does matter. And we'll talk about why it matters and we'll talk about how to effectively engage people in, in supporting a vision. Some of you in the room are as old as, are old as me or in the neighborhood of being as old as me. Remember when Clinton ran for president. That's Bill, not Hillary. Okay. All right. And remember that his tagline was, it's the economy, stupid. All right. Well, we're going to talk about it's the business, stupid. Because the value of technology is not about how cool it is or how fun it is, right? It's about how you're going to drive business value and business outcomes by leveraging that technology. Then we're going to talk about some of the characteristics in a very effective leadership, all right? We're going to talk about the need to be an effective communicator. They need to be able to develop meaningful relationships at all levels in an organization. How important it is to develop human capital and to really develop people. People are the greatest asset any organization has. Right? I've been a part of an organization that did two acquisitions. And with both acquisitions, half of the people that we acquired left. 
And when they left, half of the brain power we thought we were acquiring left out the door with them. So the acquisition was not as successful as we would hope because we lost the most important asset, which was the human beings. We'll talk a little bit about that. We we'll talk about leading the process of change. How many people are part of an organization where they've been asked to be a change agent, somebody who's going to transform an organization? We'll talk about what it means to really lead change and how to elicit people's support in doing that. Talk about partner for, partnering for success. When I first got into this industry, there were vendors, okay, and there were clients. And the idea was the client beat up the vendor, all right, tried to squeeze every penny out of the vendor. The vendor tried to give you the worst person they had at the best price point they could give you, okay? That paradigm doesn't work, right? If you want to be successful, we're going to talk about expanding your team to include partners and vendors and developing relationships, win-win relationships with them so that you can really get results as an organization. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the qualities of great leaders, what you need to really be effective as a leader in an organization, and sustainability, okay? Any football fans in the room? Show of hands? All right. I'm a Jets fan, which up until this year has been pretty much a painful experience. All right. This year, we got our 15 minutes of happiness and we'll live on that for a while. All right. And it hurts me to say this, but as much as I hate them, there's a difference between a team that wins the Super Bowl once and a team like the New England Patriots. And God, it, hurt, it hurts me to say that. But year in, year out, they're in the playoffs. All right? It's one thing to develop a level of success. It's another thing to maintain that success. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of sustainability and what it takes to do that. All right? So hopefully these are topics that are of some interest to you. I'll find out as people leave the room if they're not. But hopefully I'll keep you engaged for the next 45 minutes or so. By the way, it's a small enough group that if you want to make this interactive, I'd be happy to do that. I will definitely feel questions at the end, but if you've got a burning question or something that just doesn't sit right with you as I'm going through the presentation, speak your piece. Let me hear what you're saying and what you're thinking, and I'll definitely be happy to react to that. Okay. So my version of what is leadership. People use the terms leadership and management interchangeably. They are not the same set of muscles. Right? And to me, here's how I look at it. Leadership answers two basic questions. First of all, where are we going? Right? Second of all, why are we going there? Because if you're part of an organization, there's a lot of different things you might want to achieve. Right? But if you want to get anything accomplished, you have to focus your energies, you have to focus your resources to decide what you're going to achieve and what you're trying to accomplish. Right? So of all the things you could try to accomplish, what is the small subset of those things that you're focused on, why is that, and where are we going? Right? That's about leadership. Management is more about answering a different question. How do we get there? Okay? Once you know where you're going and why you're going there, then you've got to figure out the road. You've got to figure out the plan. And really effective management empowers people to figure out how to get there. They give them the tools and support. They don't give them the answers. Right? If you're micromanaging people, it's either that you're a bad manager or you've hired bad people. Okay? If you've hired functional, intelligent adults, Right? Set a direction for where you're trying to go. Right? Explain to them why you're trying to get there and elicit their involvement in them, and then get the heck out of their way and let them get there. Right? If they have problems, support them. All right? If they do something right, make sure they get credit for it. If they do something wrong, make sure you take the blame for it. But other than that, just get out of their way and let them get from where you are to where you're trying to be. So to me, the difference between leadership and management is that. Leadership is about where we're going and why. Management is about how we get there. Make sense? So now we've got that definition, let's talk a little bit about effective leadership in an organization, what it takes, and the impacts it has. The vision thing. How many of you are Mel Brooks fans? Anybody like Mel Brooks movies? Okay. Remember the history of the world? Okay, you've got Moses is coming down from the mountain, he's got the three tablets here, you're 15, oops, and he drops one, 10 commandments. Okay. How many of you have worked in an organization where the senior level of leadership in an organization goes to some five-star resort, probably on a nice island, where it's really nice and warm, while the rest of us are freezing in New York, okay? All right? They go there for a week and they come back with the vision. And they are now going to share with you the vision, and they expect you to be really excited about the vision. And they're stunned when you're not, okay? There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, a vision must be inspiring. Now, the first time somebody said to me, as a leader, you need to be inspiring, it was kind of intimidating, right? When I think of people who are inspirational leaders, you think of Dr. Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, people who are great speakers, people who are just, you know, larger than life. And I'm like, I'm an IT guy. Right? How am I going to be inspirational? 
Inspiration is about tapping into something inside of a person that resonates with them, that makes them want to give you their best. How many people, now you've all probably had this experience, how many people have either had something in their personal or professional life that they were just absolutely stoked about, all right? And you couldn't wait to do it, you couldn't wait to get there, you know, maybe it's you know, a, a passion of yours, for, my, for me it's music. I've been playing music since I'm 15 years old. So either playing music or going to a concert, I'm just jazzed about it, okay? So there's something about it that's really inspiring to you. And how many of you have worked in a place where you feel like a drone? Where you feel like you check your brain and your personality at the door at 8 o'clock in the morning, and on your way out at 6, you pick it back up, and you put it back on, and you become a human being again, okay? Great leadership inspires people to bring their entire selves to work, right? So that you get body and soul of the individual, not just somebody who's going to rotely do what they're going to do, punch the clock. You know, how, how many people old enough to remember the Flintstones? Okay, how for, you know, you, what was it, the rock quarry? He used to go there, he used to punch the, the, the thing and on his way out. You know, that's not what it's about. You've got to tap into something in a person that makes them want to buy into what you're doing. Okay? The vision must be directly tied into what makes people tick as a human being. If you don't do that, you don't get them to buy in. This is really critical. People need to understand the linkage between what they do, all right, and their vision of the organization. There's an old, there's an old story about this two people laying bricks. And a guy comes by and he says to the one guy, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm making $20 an hour laying bricks. Okay? Goes to the next guy, says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building the greatest cathedral in the world. Right? They both had the same job, but their vision of what it was was different. All right? If you ask the DBA on my team what he does, he's telling you he's driving participation in Tennessee in the United States. He won't tell you anything about SQL. He won't tell you anything about DBA work. It's what he's doing. But what he's really doing is helping us drive participation in tennis. Right? People need to feel a linkage between what they do day in, day out, and what the vision of the organization is. They also need to feel a part of creating and owning the vision. So when we started talking before, and we were laughing about you know, the, you know, the people who come back and give you, hand you the vision. And then they wonder why you're not excited about it. Of course, it's not your vision. It's their vision, okay? And if you're lucky, maybe their vision and your vision is kind of aligned. But more times than not, you just feel this is something that's being told to you that you have to do. A real good vision engages people, right? And they see how they fit into it, and they understand why it's important for them, and it resonates with them. And they feel that they've had ownership for that vision. So if somebody's just handing you the vision, that doesn't happen. So just a couple of thoughts on vision. Make sense to people? Questions or, or comments on it? Okay. <coughs> now, this is always a dangerous thing to say to a technical audience. Right? And I will, I will say that I came up through the technical ranks. Okay? Now, you don't want me coding anything anymore. You don't want me in your electrical closets anymore because bad things would happen. All right, because the days of me being effective as a technologist in that regard are a little bit in the past, all right? The purpose of IT is to drive business value, period, okay? It's not about it's cool. It's not about it's fun. I, I used to love, when I, I worked at Pfizer, and I had two groups reporting to me. I had a Unity group reporting to me, and I had a Microsoft group reporting to me. And they would get into these religious holy wars as to what was better. And all. Who cares, all right? What are we doing with the technology, all right? Are we doing something with the technology that helps our customers, that helps us drive revenue? That, what are we doing with the technology? If it's technology for technology's sake, it's not that interesting. If it's technology that's driving business value, that's what makes it interesting. Okay? How many of you have read or heard in a conference about IT alignment with the business? Sure. Okay. This may be the single stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire career. Okay. Of course, think about what alignment means. Alignment says there's this thing over here and there's this thing over there. And somehow we've we got to get them to try to, to meet, to talk, to get along, whatever. IT is a core part of the business. It's not separate from the business. And if you're thinking of yourself as separate from the business, and if you're working with people as if that's the business and we're IT, you shouldn't be surprised if you're not having a lot of success. IT is a key component of running any business in any industry but it's a part of the business. 
you wouldn't think of the CFO as separate from the business. You wouldn't think of the chief marketing officer as separate from the business. It's a key component of running any business. Why is it that we think of IT as the separate thing over here that has to align with the business? It's a critical part of the business. And only when we're talking to the rest of the folks in the business with us, right, as colleagues and as peers, do we get anywhere. As long as they think of us as those other people. Right? We still, when I was at Pfizer, we still lovingly refer to, anybody knows what pizza guys are? You know that expression? Right? Pizza guys are people who you don't unleash on the general public. Right? You keep them behind closed doors, and once a week you slide a pizza under the door to make sure you keep them alive. Right? <laughs> right? But you don't unleash them on the general public. Right? As long as they think of us in IT as pizza guys, those guys over there, we will get nowhere. They need to think of us as part of the business, because we are part of the business, an important part of the business. When you're doing things, you should ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, every organization, you know, it's got the mission, got the vision, but every year, your company, whatever company you work for, I don't care what industry it is, it's probably got somewhere between three and five major imperatives that they're trying to accomplish that year. Okay? Could be projects, could be revenue objectives, whatever. But they've got three to five major things that if you went to anybody with a C in his or her title, they could spit out to you, hey, this is what we're aiming to do in 2010. Okay? What are those things? And I, you don't have to answer this question, but in your own heart of hearts, do you know what those things are for your organization? Okay, that's the first question. Second of all, do you know how what you do, day in, day out, is actually going to help your organization accomplish those things? Now, some is easier and more directly tied. Some, you've got to connect a couple of dots. But in any scenario, you should understand what the important things are the organization is trying to accomplish and what you're doing to help drive that. And if the things you're doing are not aligned with helping to get those outcomes, then why are we doing it? Now, there is a certain level of IT work that has to be done in any scenario. You, you need to have email, okay? Email is, people for years have been looking for the killer application. Email is the killer application, because when email goes down, everybody goes mental, okay? And nobody could work, and you know, you know it's, it's unbelievable, right? So there's certain things you have to do to run an IT shop that may not be perceived directly impacting those business objectives. But I would argue that even those things do, because if they go away, what happens to the business objectives, okay? But what, what are the outcomes you're looking for? How do your efforts tie to those outcomes? And if they don't tie to those outcomes, think long and hard about why you're doing it. One of the things I do, and one, besides being the CIO of the UST, I, I started an executive coaching practice for IT executives. And one of the things I, I, I talk to my clients about is think about what you're doing and who you're doing it with. Right? And if you're not doing things that matter to your clients, then you're in trouble. Because if you do that long enough, you're not going to be there for very long. So you've got to make sure that there's a linkage between what you do and the bottom line of what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. Does that make sense? Okay. Fiscal management. I presented at a conference in Seattle, and there was this group of CIOs complaining about the fact that they had to manage their budget. Think about this. Right? If you're a business person, forget you're a business person, how many of you are in a committed relationship where you live with somebody else where you have to have conversations about what bills we're going to pay, what we're going to do with our money, et cetera, et cetera? I've been married 26 years. I have a lot of conversations about those things. I, I lose most of them. <laughs> um, could you imagine running any kind of enterprise, whether it be a family or a company, and not be thinking about financial responsibility? How could you be a leader? How could you be an executive and not be responsible for financial management? So it, it perplexes me when IT executives complain about, oh, I got to manage these budgets. Sure, you got to manage these budgets. So does the chief marketing officer. So does everybody else in the organization. Because to be in business means there are limited resources. One of those resources being dollars. We have to figure out what we're doing with our dollars. Okay. So that that blows my mind. The other thing is engaging the board. How many of you have had the opportunity to present to a board of directors or be in a room with a board of directors? Okay, a few of you, okay. Let me draw an analogy for you. Imagine I call you up and I say, I got this great opportunity for you, okay? It's doing the same kind of work you enjoy doing. I'm going to pay you three times what you're making now. But you've got to move to Paris, right? Some of you might buy into it, some of you, you might not. I personally wouldn't, but yeah, I've been to Paris. Um, but for a lot of people, they, they might be excited about it. So get the opportunity, put you on a plane, we ship you to Paris. Now, is your expectation that everybody you interface with in France 
is going to learn English to talk to you? Or is your expectation that you better learn how to speak French because I'm now living in Paris? Right? Many IT executives will walk into a board of directors and they will speak a foreign language. And I don't mean French, Italian, or Spanish. I mean acronymese, or what I lovingly refer to as geek speak. Right? They'll start talking about SAAS and VPNs and all this stuff. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't care what you're talking about. You're now in their country. Okay? So you better speak their language. You better be speaking return on investment. You better be speaking revenue generation. You better be speaking cost avoidance. You better be speaking the language of the board, not expecting them to speak your language, and then get frustrated that these people are idiots. They don't understand me. Well, first of all, I would suggest to you that most people who throw on a board of directors are probably not idiots. Like they probably do something in their careers that says they've got some kind of talent or some kind of intelligence. All right? It's incumbent upon us to speak their language, the language of business, the language of finance. It's not incumbent on them to learn all of their acronyms soup that we know. Now, it's interesting that as technologies become more pervasive in the, con in the consumer market, more and more they're getting dangerous because they know a little something. They know some of the vernacular. They don't know what it takes to actually run it, right? but they read something in an airline magazine. They want to know why you can't do it by Tuesday. Right? So that's kind of dangerous. But it's incumbent on us to speak their language, not by soup. Uh, not vice versa. So it's all about the business. Anybody want to challenge that? Think I'm lunatic or make sense to people? Okay. No, going backwards, that's not helpful. Communication. One of the most important things you can do in any capacity, whether you're a leader in a, in a, a formal leadership role or if you're trying to lead people through influence is be an excellent communicator. Okay. If you think you've communicated enough, communicate some more. I read somewhere the study said that you have to tell somebody something seven times before they get it. Okay. Now, my wife doesn't agree with that because she tells me, I, you told me that five times already, you stop beating the dead horse. Okay. All right. But you need to continue to communicate over and over get it ingrained in people so they understand where you're coming from. My mother, God rest her soul, used to tell me, Larry, God gave you two, ye two ears and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. Okay? Most people think about communication as speaking. I'm talking at you. The most effective communicators are people who are excellent at listening. How many of you come to events like this because you want to network? Okay? And you want to meet people and you know, have visibility into the industry, you want to network. How many of you are terrified at the idea of walking into a room with strangers and, and having to network? I know it's not my thing, okay? The best networkers are not people who have got this great gift of gab and, you know, they're the people, they're Robin Williams, they're wearing the lampshade at the, at the party. It's people who listen well. It's people who can ask a couple of simple questions and draw out from the other person what matters to them. Effective communicators are great listeners. Who do I communicate with? In my opinion, everybody, right? I want to know from the janitor to the CEO what every person in my organization and outside of my organization, our consumers, our customers, think about what we're doing, think about what we're trying to accomplish, because the more I understand where they're coming from, the better job I could do of shaping our organization and shaping our services to hit their objectives, okay? How do I communicate with them? Every way I can. Anybody here a visual learner? I know I'm a visual learner, right? So you can talk to me until I'm blue in the face, but I, I got to connect the dots. I got to see pictures. I'm a visual learner, okay? Some people are good one-on-one, -on -one, right? Talk to you one-on-one, -on -one and you come away with something. Some people are good in group settings. Some people get it in email. Some people get it on forums. There are a million different ways to communicate, and what I'm suggesting to you is you should use them all because different ways will work for different audiences, and one size does not fit all, okay? Different people are in different ways. The need for marketing. I presented to a group of 300 CIOs and told them they needed to be marketers. Half the room made a face at me that if they had guns, I would have been dead on site, okay? How many people here in this room feel that they have done, they are effective marketers or have been a marketer at some point in their career? Okay, maybe a quarter of the room. Now, how many of you are in some kind of long-term relationship, married, you know, uh, same-sex partner, whatever the case may be, in some kind of long-term committed relationship? Show of hands. 
a lot more people. Now let me ask the first question again. How many of you think you've ever done marketing in your life? Okay? Right. My wife is a beautiful, intelligent woman, and I convinced her to marry me. Right. If you don't think that involved a lot of marketing, you've got a lot of, a lot of coming, all right? Everybody markets. Marketing is about communicating a value proposition. It's about educating people. It's not you have to be the big salesman. Some people think of marketing and they think of the sleazy you know, salesman and you know, the $4,000 Canali soup coming in, glad handing people. It's not what it's about. It's about educating and communicating. And if you want to get anywhere in the leadership capacity, you've got to be able to do that effectively. Doesn't mean you've got to be the greatest orator in the world, it just means you've got to be able to connect with people and get your message across. Okay? Communicating tough messages. A lot of people have gone to the ostrich school of management. Whenever there's a problem, they will dig their head in the sand and pray to God that it goes away. Right? And I will say to you, the problems are like terminal diseases. If left alone, they only get worse. Right? You've got to do something, you've got to do triage. All right? If you've got a tough message to communicate to somebody, don't be a jackass about how you communicate, excuse my language, right? Communicate in a constructive and positive professional way. But you've got to let the other person understand that there's a challenge there. Right? Otherwise, they're going along their merry way thinking everything's fine and dandy until the thing goes boom. And then you say, well, the thing went boom. And they said, well, when did you know that was happening? Well, six months ago. Why didn't you tell me? Right? You need to learn how to communicate tough messages in a constructive way. And one of the best ways of doing that is focus on the issue, not the person. So it's not you're stupid. It's maybe there's a better way to tackle that problem. Okay? So always focus on the issue, not the person. Be honest and transparent. The worst thing in the world is for people to have to try to guess what you're thinking. Right? If they have to guess what you're thinking, you're a terrible leader. You should be honest with people. You should be transparent. They should be able to read you like a book. One thing I can tell you, I will never play poker for a living because I would go broke within five minutes. Because right? I wear my heart on my sleeve, which is not always a good thing, but that's who I am. But people know where, I, where I'm coming from and where I stand on issues. And if you're going to be an effective leader, you should be transparent. You should be honest with people. Possibly the single most important thing a leader needs to be is an effective relationship manager. And what I mean by relationship management, it's interesting, because when people talk about networking, people talk about relationship, they, they're thinking about what's in it for me. If you're a leader, your focus should be what's in it for them. Okay? You know, the whiff from what's in it for me should be what's in it for them. W-I-F-T. I can't pronounce that, but whatever that acronym sounds like, okay? Focus on helping other people succeed. And when you do that, all ships rise with the tide. Right? If you're focusing on me, it's all about me and what I'm trying to accomplish and my objectives and my organization, who's going to want to help you? If you're focusing on them, all right, wonderful things, magical things happen. I'm a big believer in karma. You put good stuff out there and you'd be surprised how much of it comes back at you, okay? Be a team builder. It's all about the team. Make sure the team wins. I'll share a little vignette with you. When I was, any, any hockey players or hockey fans in the room by any chance? Okay, a couple. When I was a kid, I played hockey. And it was a different day. You know, believe it or not, I was an athlete at one point. And can't tell by looking at me now, but you know, it was 30 years ago. But I, one, one year, I was the captain of my team and led the league in scoring in the hockey league. Okay? My team didn't make the playoffs. Keep that in the back of your mind for a second. So we go to the awards ceremony. And the team won, the, the, won their version of the Stanley Cup. They all get their trophies, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to the MVP of the year. Of the year. And I'm figuring out this one in the bag. Led, led the league in goals, led the league in scoring. It's got to be me. And they announced somebody else. And I'm stunned. And my coach is sitting next to me. And I go to my coach and I said, how could they not choose me? And he said something that stuck with me for 30 plus years. And is, is if you take nothing else away from this conversation, take this away. He looked at me and he says, Larry, there are no winners on a losing team. Okay? Now, the corollary of that is also true. There are no losers on a winning team. The guy who was the utility player on the Yankees, and I'm a Mets fan, so this kills me to say this too, right? But the guy who's the utility player on the Yankees, who's gotten 20 at bats last year, but was on the roster for the World Series, that guy's got a ring. Okay? The ring doesn't say, yeah, I only got 20 at bats. The ring doesn't say, I only hit 230. The ring doesn't say, I backed up Derek Jeter the five games he didn't play. It just says, I'm a world champion. Okay? Make sure the team wins because it's all about the team. You need to build credibility. The easiest way to do that is say what you mean, 
and mean what you say. Right? So say what you mean. Don't have, don't talk in circles around people so they're trying to figure out what is he really getting at? What is he really trying to accomplish? Say what you mean. Speak in plain English. All right? And mean what you say. If people know, there's not a lot about me that's all that special. But people know one thing about me. If I say something, you can take it to the bank. Right? If I say to you, I'm going to have dinner with you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. If I'm not knocking out your door at 5 to 7, call the police or the paramedics. Because I'm dead somewhere on the road. Because right? I'm a man of my word. Right? Ain't real good looking, ain't real sharp. All right? But I'm a man of my word. All right? So make sure people know that you are credible and that what you say, they can take to the bank. Leaders serve. The thing that, that, that scares me the most is when you hear somebody who's just gotten to an executive position and now they feel, I've made it, now people are going to take care of me. Right? Your role as a leader is to take care of them. Right? It's to make sure that your people have the recognition they deserve, the rewards they deserve, that when the bomb goes boom, you drop yourself on the bomb so they don't get hit with the shrapnel. It's about serving them. It's not being served by them. This next one is interesting. Really, you know, anyone ever hear the, the, the term perception is reality? Okay. I came to the USTA and inherited what I honestly would say that I'm, I've been at this 28 years, was the single most dysfunctional IT organization I'd ever seen in my life. It was a train wreck. Okay. The first thing the CEO said to me is, IT is a black hole where money goes in and nothing of value comes out. Welcome to the USDA. <laughs> Excellent. Great job. Um, so we started changing things. And right away, we sent out an IT scorecard and got a baseline of satisfaction. And needless to say, satisfaction was not particularly high. Six months later, we sent out the same scorecard. And on a scale of one to five, we were getting scores like two, eight, three when we first started. Six months later, we were getting scores four. 4-2. And they thought I was a miracle worker. This guy just totally transformed the organization. Not really. Now, we have made some progress. You know, we had gotten some of the low hanging fruit and fixed a couple of things, and we were getting there. But there's no way that the difference between what the service we were providing was that, that stark. But people's perception was, these people get it. People's perception was, these people are talking to us. People's perception was they care about what matters to us, and they're doing things to make it work. So their perception was much better than the reality. Okay, that's part of relationship management. Okay, it's it's getting people to believe in where you're going even before you necessarily get there. And finally, and I've said this throughout this whole slide, when you're a leader, it's never about you. It's about your people. It's about people on your project team, it's about your clients, it's never about you. The day it all becomes about you is the day you should stop being a leader. Questions, comments? This resonates with folks. Okay. How many of you have heard chapter and verse on competitive advantage? Competitive advantage. In this day and age, any competitive advantage a company has is very short-lived because anything that you can do within a matter of days or weeks, you can do. Okay? So I would suggest to you, in my opinion, the only real competitive advantage any organization has is the talents and passion of their people. Period. The people are the differentiator in a high-performance organization versus a mediocre organization. Not, not Anything else, not the patents they own, not the, the marketing effort, nothing. It's the people. Okay? As a leader, developing other leaders is your top priority. Of course, leadership is, cannot be done in a vacuum. Okay? You ever see organizations where they say, well, you know, if this person ever you know, won the lottery or got hit by a car or something, we would all go into the toilet. That's a terrible organization from a leadership perspective. I can go on vacation for a month. I've never done it. I'd like to try it one time, actually. But I could go on vacation for a month, and I wouldn't give a second thought to the way my organization is running. Because I've had outstanding leaders throughout my organization who they don't need me to keep the ship afloat. I mean, half of them would tell you you probably can get the ship moving faster if I was out of the way. Okay? <laughs> Developing leaders is your top priority. You don't lead people, you lead persons. Any English majors in the room? Because if you're, if you're, you're going to be upset with me from a grammatical perspective, because I know that's, that's not proper English. Right? But what I mean by that is, is the following. 
I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I had a woman on my team who did an outstanding job. She had a very important, very visible project. She did an outstanding job. And we had a town hall meeting where the whole team was together. And I, I, I called her up and I said, I just want, I want to call Kathy up. I want to recognize Kathy for doing an unbelievable job. She knocked the ball out of the park with this. And because of this, we're going to have a banner here. Everybody, a big round of applause. Meeting adjourns. Kathy comes over to me. I figure she's going to thank me for recognizing her. She says to me, Larry, if you ever do that to me again, I will kill you. Kathy hated public recognition. Right? Lesson learned. You don't need people. You need persons. Because what matters to you is different from what matters to you. What motivates you is different from what motivates me. You need to understand the human beings you're working with and what makes them tick. And you need to tailor your approach based upon each of those individual characteristics. Okay? Now, I love this one. How many of you have worked for an organization where they say, well, we can't give you all this training because if we give you all this training, you'll leave. Because you'll be more marketable. Okay? People don't leave because they've had the opportunity to grow. They leave because they haven't had the opportunity to grow. Okay? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, but, but that's the perception. I make sure that my people have every possible opportunity I could afford them to get better and to grow. And you know what? If one or two of them leave along the way because they got a better opportunity, God bless you. Good for you. Because right? my job was not just to give you a paycheck every two weeks. My job was to help you grow as a professional. And if I did that, and that means you found an opportunity somewhere else, then I did my job well. Now, I hope, for the most part, that people stay with me. But my job is not to keep people for 30 years. My job is that as long as they're with me, they're doing the best they can do to contribute to our objectives. Right, so grow people, give them the opportunity to grow. Each people has unique gifts. If you play to people's strengths, they will succeed. If you play to the areas of development, they will fail. When I took this job, one of the first things I was told is, here's your severance budget, fire all these people. I said, well, well, settle down, settle down. Before we start firing everybody, let's figure out what the problems are here. Okay? And it wasn't that we had bad people, but there were people who were miscast. Okay. How many basketball fans here? Any Knicks fans? Okay. Anybody knows who Patrick Ewing is? Okay. Patrick Ewing was all-star center, guy seven foot tall, right? great offensive player in the paint. You don't want Patrick Ewing shooting your three-pointers. It's not what he's good at. It's not who he is. It's not his skill base. Okay. But yet, organizations will try to cram people into a mold, regardless of if they're good at that or not. Great leaders take people and play to their unique strengths and try to minimize the impact of their areas of development, which we all have. Okay? Anybody, people who know Pat Riley, the name Pat Riley, ring a bell, I know it for the basketball fans. Pat Riley was a, is a, a world-class basketball coach, Hall of Fame basketball coach. He first coached the Los Angeles Lakers, who were perhaps the most gifted, fluid, athletic, basketball team perhaps in the history of the NBA, right? The, the, the name of the team was Showtime because it was like watching a ballet. And he, he coached them and they won a couple of championships. Then he came to coach the Knicks. And the Knicks weren't thoroughbreds like the Lakers. They were plow horses, okay? They were big, tough, slow guys. Now, Pat Riley had one of two options. Let's get rid of all of these plow horses and get me some thoroughbreds. Not that easy to do when you're running an organization. You can't just make wholesale changes like that, you know? Or say, all right, this is what I've got. This is the skill set of the people on my team. How do I modify my approach to make this a winning team? Great leaders work with what they have to make those people's attributes come out and make that a winning team. And most importantly, recognize your people's efforts and their success, right? Most of us, I know I'm, I'm type A New Yorker. And for me, when I get something accomplished, I check it off the list and I'm on to the next thing. Right? I don't celebrate. Make sure your people feel good about the success they've had and they're recognized for it in a way that works for them and that they feel appreciated for what they did. Not just with a paycheck, okay, but that they genuinely feel that somebody cares about. There, there was a book that came out, uh, and it was a guy who does, what's the group that does the census? I forget the... Uh, it's one of the groups that does like all these census type things. And they ask, why do people leave an organization? Most people are leaving an organization because they feel there's nobody in that organization that cares about them or cares about what matters to them. Right? Make sure your people feel that 
cared about them and you recognized their efforts and their success, not only at the end of a project, but as they're having incremental success and progress along the way. Have I said anything that has made you think, the guy's nuts? You don't want to admit it. All right. Okay. People are always, organizations are always looking for change agents, transformational specialists. Okay. What does that mean? What is required to transform an organization? There's some key ingredients in leading the process of change. One is, again, and we talked a little bit about this before, involve people in the process. Sell the need for change. Okay? If people think everything's going great and everybody's fat, dumb, and happy, why do I need to change? Okay? Everything's going great. I don't need to change. Things are going great. People need to understand, not just at an organizational level, but at a personal level, why change is important and why it matters to them as individuals and to the organization as a whole. And you need to get their buy-in. If you don't get their buy-in, you're going to get a half-hearted effort and you're not going to be able to... You cannot turn a pig into a prince with a half-hearted effort. It's not going to work, right? If you're truly going to transform an organization, you need to get the best out of people, so you need to get their buy-in. Now, this is, this is a controversial statement, but I found it to be true. You've got to get the right people on the train and the wrong people off the train. When I got into this job, I got my team together, we did a lot of work in figuring out what we had to do, and I said, look, Here's what our clients have told us. Here's what you've told us. Here's what our partners have told us. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to go, based upon all that input. Now, for some of you, you might be energized by that. You say, you know what? That's something I can buy into. I'm excited about that. I want to be a part of making that happen. For some of you, maybe not so much. Maybe this is not what you bought, it, you know, bought into. Maybe this is not what you thought you were getting into when you took this job. And you don't really want to do this. If you don't, that's fine. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're a bad fit. You're in the wrong place. I'll help you find a job somewhere else. Now, granted, it was in 2009 where you know, it was a little easier to do that a couple years ago. But still, I'll help you find a job somewhere else where you being you can work. Because you shouldn't try to be somebody else who you're not. But if you want to be on this train, you've got to buy into this program. Because here's where we're going. And we're going there fast. And if you're going to slow down every inch of the way, we're never going to get there. So you've got to make sure you get the people on the train and the people who aren't going to buy it for whatever reason, get them off the tracks because they're only going to get hurt. It does, it does them a disservice and it does you a disservice. Break your plan into bite-sized chunks. How many of you have heard the joke? How do you need an, how do you need an elephant? Who's got the answer? How do we need an elephant? Bite at a time. Okay? Exactly how you do it, right? And make sure that you track that. Because a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to, I wanted to get another master's degree. I wanted to get a master's degree in organizational leadership. Because I knew I was going to start my executive coaching practice. And I felt that it would be a valuable credential to have and something that would help me be more effective in that role. And I got a program that, in a year, I was able to knock off 60 credits. My wife said, you're out of your mind. She's not wrong about that. But 60 credits in a year. Okay. How did I do that? If I looked at it in its entirety, it would have been overwhelming. But every day I did something. So today I'm going to read these three chapters. Tomorrow I'm going to do this paper. Right? And if you do it that way, slowly but surely you get where you need to go. Right? So make sure that you're breaking the plan into bite-sized chunks and you're tracking progress along the way. You don't find out that you're 15 miles off course at the end of the journey. You've got to do mid-air correction. So make sure you're tracking the progress you're making so that if there are some full steps, you get back on track. No big deal. We lost a couple of days. We're back on track. Let's go. Celebrate and communicate progress. Make sure everybody knows the progress you're making and the successes you have. A lot of people think of IT as a utility. Right? Now that's getting better. We're making progress. But there are still people who think of IT as a utility. Now let me ask you this. Let's, let's use another example as a utility. Cable, cable TV, a uh, perfect example. I was, I was trying to watch TV last night, have cable vision, and all of a sudden, cable vision wasn't there. Okay. When do you think about a utility? Usually there's two times you think about a utility. When the bill comes, and you're not happy with the bill, right? or when the cable goes out. If people think of IT as a utility, which hopefully they don't, and hopefully we're making them not think about it that way, because it's a good thing, what we're doing. But if they think about it as a utility, 
and the only data points they have about it is when the cable goes out, that's bad PR. You've got to make them understand the 99.9% .9 of the time that things are going well, that you're making progress, that you're meeting your objectives. And I'm not talking about big marketing efforts, just matter of fact, communication. Hey, we had this project, got it done on time, got it done on budget, this was the impact of the organization. Any questions, right? Just education. Make sure that you communicate your progress and you celebrate the success. Don't just move on to the next thing. Make sure the people who've worked so hard to make that happen are recognized and feel appreciated for what they did. Never stop evolving. I had a guy once, when I was at Pfizer, asked me, when are we going to go back to normal? You're never going to go back to normal. This is normal now. Change is the new normal. Every day, you're either growing or you're dying. That's the way things work in nature, okay? So you're either evolving and getting better, or somebody, your competitor, is going to leave you in the dust. Okay? There are a lot of organizations that were world-class organizations that no longer exist. I remember digital equipment tech, you know, DEC, remember DEC? Okay, mm -hmm. DEC Vaxes, there's a couple of you as old as me, okay? All right? Where's DEC? DEC's gone. Right? They weren't one of the first groups that came out with Ethernet, by the way. They're gone. Right? Why? They didn't evolve. Right? So either you're evolving or you're dying, so never stop evolving, change is the new business as usual. First of all, you've got to develop a partnership with your team. If your team has the mentality that there's management and there's labor, you've got a problem on your hands, okay? My team knows that I'm a part of their team, they're a part of my team, right? I'm there to support them, right? And they know that they're every bit as important to that team as I am. Now, I may be the quarterback, right? And when you're the quarterback, when you win, you get too much credit, when you lose, you take too much of the blame. That's the nature of being a quarterback. But quarterbacks don't win too many Super Bowls if their offensive line don't block for them. Right, they spend a lot of time on their backs looking up at the sun. All right? You're getting sacked, you're not going to win too many games. It's a team effort, and you've got to make sure that you are in partnership with your team and that they feel that, and that you've developed a culture of empowerment. My people are free to do whatever they need to do to get the job done. They don't need my permission. Now, if they need my support, they know where I live, but they don't need my permission. Okay? Create that kind of an environment. Shared accountability. A lot of people talk about career development. Whose responsibility is career development? Is it yours? Is it your manager's? At the end of the day, you're the one who's going to either profit or suffer from it. So I would suggest to you that it's in your best interest to think about it in a big way, like it's yours, okay? But at the end of the day, it should be a shared accountability. You shouldn't wait for somebody to guide you, but you also should, you should participate in the process, but they should also put some skin in the game and help you. So being a part of an effective team is a shared accountability. And expand your team to include the, the vendors you work with and the partners you work with. And make sure that they want to be a part of your team because those people are an extension of your team and they're touching your clients, they're doing things that impact your value and your service and your success. If you treat them like garbage, guess what? They did a survey. You know the best way to tell if people are being treated well at work by their management? Look at how they treat their customers. Right? If you've got a customer support organization that's getting treated poorly, they have terrible customer service. If you've got a great customer support organization and, and the customers say, wow, this is a great experience, I want to continue to do business with these people because of that, pretty good chance they're getting treated pretty well by their management. Okay? That's how you can tell what people are getting treated because they, they will magnify that out to the people they work with. We're in the home stretch. Hang in there a couple more slides. Just a couple of summary qualities of great leaders, some of we talked about. Authenticity. Be yourself, but be your best self. When I first got a leadership position, I was, I was terrified because I thought I had to be somebody I wasn't. Be yourself. Be authentic. How many football fans again? Okay. How many know who Tony Dungy and Bill Cowell are? A couple of people. Tony Dungy and Bill Cowell were coaches of Super Bowl winning teams. Tony Dungy is the sweetest, most religious, most mild-mannered, good-natured man you ever want to meet. He's just, he's just a salt-of-the-earth person. The kind of person you want to bring home to mom. Okay? Bill Cowell is the kind of guy who's going to get two inches from your face, yell at you, curse at you, and spit at you. Okay? Both of them won Super Bowls. Right? Very different styles, very different personalities. They played to their strengths. They played to who they were. They didn't try to be somebody they weren't. It just doesn't work. Right? It's not authentic. People see right through it. Be humble. 
right? Working in IT, one of the wonderful things about working in IT is you're automatically humble, because IT is an incredibly humbling experience, okay? Because <laughs> you're at the top of the mountain, you know, and like two minutes later, email just went down and you're an idiot again. So I mean, you know, it's, it's very, it, hum, humility is built right into the process. It's really great that way. But be humble. Leadership is a responsibility, not a privilege. Leaders serve, we talked about that. Great leaders are great communicators and inspire people. This one is, is a personal hot button for me. Leaders have a strong bias towards action. The biggest way to destroy an organization is paralysis of analysis. You sit there and you think about it, and you think about it some more, and you think about it some more. You're never going to have all the answers. You're never going to have all the data. It's impossible. Get some smart people together, do as much thinking as is rational to do, and then do something. Do something. It's easier to correct something wrong than to do to, to like try to do a forklift change when you've done nothing. And no decision is a decision, and it has impacts. A lot of people have been left in the dust because they didn't make a decision and their competitors did. And off they ran, and they sat there wondering what the hell happened. Right? Strong bias towards action. Leaders understand that we are smarter than me. I am absolutely the stupidest person in my organization. I say that proudly. Right? My goal is to surround myself with people smarter than me. Now, granted, in my case, that's not too tough, right? but that's my goal. The collective team is always smarter than any individual, even if one of the individuals on the team is a genius. Right? Leverage that. Don't try to be the guy or gal who's got all the answers. We talked a little bit about some of these other things. Build a sense of community. My organization is a place where people want to come to work. Right? We're a not-for-profit organization. I got Starwoods Hotels across the street from me, I got PepsiCo down the block from me, and I've got Avon about a half a mile from me. My people could go work for any of those organizations and probably make 20% more than I'm paying. Why do they keep coming back here? Right? They feel a part of something, they feel part of a community, they feel valued, right? critical. Develop relationships with individuals, we talked about that. Be receptive to honest feedback. Okay? If people are afraid to tell you the truth, if people are afraid to tell you the emperor has no clothes, you will fail. Because you will make mistakes, I promise you, you will make mistakes. And if nobody's willing to say to you, Larry, there's a huge pothole two feet in front of you, and if you don't do something fast, you're going head first into that pothole, then you will go into the pothole. So you accept honest feedback, appreciate it, and value it. Don't punish people for telling you the truth or their truth. Right? You have to be open to honest feedback. Talk about empowering people. Leaders give their people, I always say, my job as a leader is to make sure when things go well, they get the credit. When things go poorly, I jump on the bomb. Right? Right. Most leaders I know, or a lot of leaders I've seen, who are not effective leaders, when things go great, they're up there taking it. But thank you, thank you, it's all me. I'm wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> when things go bad, Joe, what'd you do? You blew that. No, it's the opposite. Right? Make sure your people are getting the credit when things go well and you jump on the bomb. When you do that, the greatest compliment I ever got in my entire professional career. We did, any of you do a 360 evaluation in your organization where your management rates you, your people rate you, your peers rate you, your customers rate you? We did that when I was working at Pfizer. And one of the, one of the pieces of feedback that came back was his people would knock down the gates of hell for him. That's the greatest compliment I've ever gotten in my life. Okay? Make sure that your people feel that way about you because you care about them. And not care some. BS, phony way, attaboy, stuff like that. You genuinely care about what matters to them, and you're supporting their efforts and their development. Okay? Most importantly, leaders have integrity. There's no expression, what you do speak so loudly, I can't hear what you say. You could be espousing all the right things, but it's, it's not how you talk the talk, it's how you walk the talk. And people will see how you are. And how many of you are parents? Okay? How many of you are telling your kids, don't do drugs, don't drink, and then you get stoned on the weekend? Okay? They don't see that? Come on. All right. Walk the talk. It's imperative if you want to be a leader. You have to have integrity. Last topic, and then we'll open it up to questions. Sustainability. <clears throat> Getting to a level of success is great. Staying there is more important. Okay? So if you've got a team that won the Super Bowl and the next year, you know, they're six and ten and they never make the playoffs again for the next five years, well, enjoy the Super Bowl, that was great, but you know, great teams are competitive every year. A leader can't do that. In order to do that, you have to have a culture of leadership. You have to have leaders throughout your organization. I've got leaders at every, every level in my organization. 
I could give you 10 names of people who I tell you in, in 20 years, when hopefully I'm retired from this and doing something else, all right? These people are going to be fantastic CIOs, fantastic CIOs, right? Leadership is a team sport, and you have to develop a culture of leadership. And the main responsibility of the leader is creating other leaders and developing those other leaders throughout the entire organization. Okay. Questions and thoughts? Before we go on to questions, i do a quick intro. Hold on one moment. First, uh, a few people came in after uh, this begun, so I'll just give a reiteration. This is Larry Bonfante. He's the Chief Information Officer of the United States Tennis Association. I figure you all know that from the email. What you may not know is he's also responsible for all the IT services of the U.S. Open, which is the world's most highly attended annual sporting event, which is an enormous, enormous task. So I want to thank Larry. He's been an incredibly enlightening and Informative presentation. If everyone, round of applause. And in fact, Dunlop had heard about this event and had found out about this event and had given a contest prize, a brand new tennis racket signed by Thomas Burdich. Pronouncing it right? Yes, you are. Uh, both the racket and the case is signed by him. Wow. I will email out information on how to enter the raffle prize, uh, how to enter to win the raffle prize. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors. Number one, Sun Microsystems. They have provided us wonderful room service as well as other services. And as well as uh, Microsoft Online Business Productivity Suite and the Vork Enterprise PHP Framework. And uh, let's Go for the questions. Questions, thoughts. Sir. Can you give us some idea of uh, the number of staff and resources, budget, whatever sure. you're willing to? Sure. It's, it's, it's an interesting job, an interesting organization, because I've got kind of three jobs. The first job is running a $250 million enterprise at CIO. The second job is running U.S. Open, which in, in two weeks, we generate 90% of our revenue. It's still the world's most highly attended annual sporting event. Right? Third job is we've got 750,000 members who provide online services to support them. Right? So two different jobs in one. My team is about 25 people, but we have a lot of partnerships. We have a lot of relationships where we get things accomplished outside of people who have a USTA bench. So if you look at how many people are actually probably doing the work of the USTA from an IT perspective, probably more like 100 or so but only 25 of them have a USTA badge. Uh, operating budget is around $7 million a year, uh, which is interesting, because when I came from Pfizer, my, my budget just to run one part of IT is about $40 million a year. So you get really creative and really innovative when you got to do all these things with a fraction of the money. So over beers, we can talk about that sometimes, but that's, that's a uh, perspective on that. And we also have a capital budget every year that kind of weighs and waxes depending on the issues we have in any, any given year that we're trying to run. Can I give you a little more feel for it? Gentlemen, back. What's your bar for people that need to stay on the train, and how far do you go to tolerate people's business? There are two aspects of any effective employee, in my opinion. Aptitude and attitude. Right? I'd rather have somebody with an A attitude and a B aptitude, because I can help train that person. I can help develop that person's skills. But if they got an A aptitude but a lousy attitude, I've got a problem with that. The best technical person I ever had in my employee, we'll call him Vinny. When I worked at, at Pfizer, this was a person who six years before anybody knew what WWW stood for, he understood the value and the vision of the internet. He did. He was brilliant. He also, excuse my French, pissed off every individual he came into contact with every day that he worked there. So just because he was brilliant, he was useless in that capacity. So to me, it's a combination of aptitude and attitude, and I err more on the side of attitude because, again, most intelligent people can learn and can be trained, but getting somebody to shift the way they think, that's a little tougher. That answer your question? Gentlemen in the back. So I run a small company, around 15 people, and the problem is the running through is a day-to-day -day operation. Sometimes we do a meeting, we plan things, but then we don't. Like maybe the plan doesn't get followed, we don't kind of reiterate it. How do you plan such a large team or 
organization, what for your experiences, what, what we can do small businesses? First of all, make sure everybody contributes to that plan and has an, a sense of ownership for that plan. Because otherwise, they're not going to buy into it. And everybody thinks they know better. Human nature is such that I think I got all the answers. We all think we have all the answers. None of us do, but you know. So make sure they buy into the plan. And if they're not following the plan, it's either because they didn't understand the plan, they didn't buy into the plan, or they're trying to torpedo the plan. Right? So find out why they're not buying into the plan. The most important thing you can do is set the vision and, and tell people this is what success looks like. Most people wander around aimlessly and aren't successful because they don't know what success looks like. They don't know what's expected of them. If you set that vision for them and you give them the tools to do it, they'll find a way to do it. Right? So if, if they're not following the plan, you got to get to the, to the crux of why they're not following the plan. And I would suggest it's probably one of those three things. Gentlemen on side. Um, what are the new technologies we should be looking into and learning? Uh, nothing you haven't heard before. We're doing a lot of work with cloud computing. Uh, I've lowered my hosting cost by about 70% because we've put all back in and then systems into the cloud. Uh, we, we're doing a lot of stuff with mobile computing. We have 750,000 people who use our online services. A lot of them want to use that from their, their iPhone, their Blackberry, their PDA, whatever the case may be. So we're doing a lot of work to take a lot of that functionality, putting it on a mobile platform. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with digital asset management. We have a lot of historical video footage of the US Open and such. We're turning that, we're digitizing that, and we're finding ways to monetize that, to turn that around. So those are some of the technology things that we're really focused on. But it's, uh, a lot of, you know, we're on the bleeding edge with a lot of stuff. Not because I enjoy being on the bleeding edge, but because we, we're a mid-sized company. We don't have the budget to, to, you know, always do it the safe way. So for instance, there's, there's a product that Cisco came out with called Clean Access. Before it was in shrink wrap, we were using it from a security perspective because we had to do something that was so unique that there was nothing on the market that would allow us to do it, and we had to take the risk of doing it with, with something that was needed. There was no documentation available for it. So I'm not suggesting that you do that if you don't have to, but we have to be on the bleeding edge a lot of times because of the nature of our business. Young lady in the back. service we do for people is you take somebody who's an excellent technologist and how do you reward them? You put them in a management position. Well, that may be a good thing or maybe a bad thing for them and for you. Right? Different set of muscles. Right? I look for people who, first of all, are open to learning. I look for people who enjoy working with other people and communicating with other people. I look for people who have influence. In any organization, there's the people on an org chart who are supposedly influential, but then there's the people who everybody knows. I go to John or Jane, because that's the person that gets things done, and they may or may not be the person who on an org chart has the influence, but they're the go-to gal or guy. I look for those kinds of people, the people that other people gravitate towards, enjoy working with, and the people who have the reputation of the people who get things done. Those are the kind of characteristics. They don't have to be the technical god or goddess. They are, that's great, but they don't have to be. Many times they're not. Gentleman in the back. What's the most difficult decision you have, you've had to make as a CIO, and how do you overcome that challenge? We had to downsize our organization. I'm not, that's not surprising in this day and age. And we actually, and these were all, these, there was no dead wood. These weren't people who were just, you know, sitting around collecting a check, doing nothing. These were all good, talented people who have contributed to helping us turn this organization around. And that was a lot of sleepless nights because these are good people who I value. We were able to downsize it in a way that had a, as minimal an impact as it could to people. Of course, go ask the people who were impacted. If they had it, they wouldn't tell you it was minimal because it was human beings. But we did it in a way that was respectful of those people. We made sure that we helped them find other opportunities, find other leads. We gave them way, way lead time in advance. We gave them good severance. And we did it in a way that was respectful and that also made the other people understand this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is what's changing. A year later, we had 24% fewer staff people in the organization, right? And lowered our budget 10%. We had the best IT scores we ever received on any of our scorecards. 
we were actually better and doing things better, more efficiently, more effectively, which I, I couldn't even believe. But that was the hardest thing I ever had to do because you're impacting people. And I truly value people, and these were people who helped me to have the success I had. But there are times in business where you do what you got to do. It's not fun. Sir? Are you using any kind of social networking tools? Yeah. Uh, we, we have a lot of Facebook groups because uh, our big push is six to ten year old kids playing tennis. Right? In this country, six to ten year old kids play organized soccer or baseball for the most part. We want those kids playing tennis. And we want them playing it as a team sport. And we want them to learn it as beginners because that's our next generation of tennis players. And tennis is a sport you can play for a lifetime. I'm 50 years old. I used to play hockey and football. Those days are gone for me, trust me. When I get out of the car, I start to creep. Right? So I'm not going to be playing hockey or football anytime soon, but I can still play tennis. Right? So we're trying to get them early. So we're, we're, we're working with Twitter. Uh, we're working with Facebook. We're trying to be where the next generation of, of tennis players are so we, we can be meaningful to them and make them a part of our world. The lady here first. I'm sorry. This, and keeping with that, just as a side thought, because I have a niece and a nephew, but are you doing things with inner city kids who may not necessarily have access to tennis courts? Absolutely. Okay. Huge amount. And it's interesting because, you know, I had never played tennis until I went to the USTA. Now I play poorly, but I play. Right. But my perception growing up, I'm, I'm a kid from Brooklyn, which you can tell from listening to me talk, right? Um, we didn't have tennis courts, right? We had stickball, you know, because you, you take a broom handle and you get a ball for 30 cents yeah. and you play, you know. You had a basketball for 10 bucks and you go to your schoolyard, you know. My impression, if you said tennis, paint the picture of tennis, 50 year old, White male Greenwich, Connecticut. Okay? That was my picture of tennis, who played tennis. Here's the reality. If you look at the demographics of this country, if that's the only audience that we're appealing to, within 20 years, we're dead. Okay? So we have made a big push, a big push to make tennis accessible to everyone. <clears throat> everyone. Diversity on every level. Diversity of thought, diversity of gender, diversity of ethnicity, race, everyone. We're working with groups called NJTLs, who also will go into the inter inner city and not only make tennis available to kids, but also help them with education, right? Because it, it's a value proposition their parents could buy into. You're helping the kids succeed, helping to educate them, and also turning them on to tennis, which gives them a positive, constructive use of their time when they're not in school. So we're doing a lot of work in the inner cities, yes. Thank you. Sure. Can, can you share anything with, about how you manage this Twitter and Facebook activity within your organization? You know, it's, it's fairly early days. We've got groups out on Facebook, and what we're doing is we're turning people onto on our website. If you're interested in what we call Quick Start Tennis, which is Tennis with Kids, we'll send you to a, face, a Facebook group and get people engaged in that, in that regard. So we're just starting to poke at it and try to figure out how to best use it. I don't think anyone's really figured out how to best monetize it or use it, but we're just trying to make ourselves be where they are as opposed to trying to drag them where we are. So have you got, like, a person who's responsible for dealing with those things or something like that? See, and this is, the, this is to me the great fallacy, is social media is the separate thing to get the separate god or goddess of social media. Social media is just another way to engage people. So our marketing people are involved in it, our sales people are involved in it, our technical people, everybody's involved in it, because it's just another medium. You know, so to think it's this different thing, it's just a different way to accomplish the same things we've been accomplishing for years. We have time for one more question, and afterwards, Larry will be up here, and you can do one-on-one -on -one questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Show hands again. The question. You know what? If, if you don't mind, just to give out a couple questions, this gentleman here. Oh hi. Um, so I um, I recently heard this uh, concept about personal knowledge. Basically, something you know more about is harder for you to compare to someone who doesn't know about it. So I um, I think you uh, you mentioned something about marketing. Um, that's very important. Um, so uh, can you give, give us uh, some tips or example how you market the IT to uh, the other part of the organization of your client? Sure. Um, I make sure that everyone knows what we're doing. I make sure they know what's in it for the organization. I do it in a couple of ways. I get in front of my board of directors at least quarterly to give them a state of the union, okay, and compare and contrast our success against the typical IT organization, okay, I make sure that all of the projects that, and here, this is the key thing, we partner with various business leaders on projects, okay? They're the ones who get recognized when the project succeeds. Okay? They recognize it. Because when the CMO says, this is great, and Larry's team helped me do that, that's got so much more credibility 
than me standing up and patting myself on the back. Right? When I go back to the board for funding, and the CMO is the guy who's saying, hey, give these people money, because the last time you gave them money, look what they turned it into for us. Okay? So some of the marketing is get other people to do your marketing for you, making sure that they're recognized for the successes that you're having jointly as a team. Right? But we send out newsletters, we, get, we do town hall meetings. I get in front of people constantly. I want them to know <coughs> what we're doing for this organization and how if you stop funding us, this organization dies. I'll say it that way, but if you connect the dots, you figure it out. That was, I guess, the last question, but I'll be around if anybody wants to come up and chat. Larry, thank you very much for My coming. Can we ask you some more questions and we'll see you all next month. Thank you all for coming. By the way, if you've got any questions, drop me, uh, drop me an email up at my, uh, my practice email address. Uh.